Welcome to the New York Botanical Garden and the Plant Intelligence Symposium. We're very happy to see you all here. It looked for a moment exceedingly tricky, um, but here we all are to discuss this interesting topic. I'm your host, Vanessa Sellers. I'm heading the Humanities Institute, a division for research here in the Mertz Library, focused on um, bringing together the sciences and the humanities. And this is a visionary idea by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. This is the fifth annual Humanities Symposium and it continues to celebrate the Botanical Garden as a really vital international plant research center. You might say that here at the garden, plants speak to us. So what better place than to ask the question this morning, do plants have intelligence? Each of you will have a different idea about this topic and you will hear more about it because here we have this day and he came happily enough a day earlier before the storm is Peter Wohlleben, the well-known author of The Hidden Life of Trees, as well as moderator Janet Brown. I have some bad news that Stefano Mancuso is still stuck in London. Yes, he, he was so frustrated and we were of course also very sad that he couldn't be here this morning. We even tried to have him come in via Skype, but since he was in transit, that option was also out of the question. He sends uh, his heartfelt regrets and he's really sorry to miss this day's discussion and your questions and we hope he will be back one day. It is now my great pleasure and honor to introduce you to Harvard's distinguished historian of science, Janet Brown. Dr. Brown is a British historian of science, known especially for her work on the history of 19th century biology and natural history, including Charles Darwin, a topic of various books and an acclaimed biography recently published by her. Currently, Dr. Brown is Ehrman Professor of Harvard's Faculty of the Arts and Sciences. And um, she has also taught in London, where she's from, of course, at the Wellcome Trust uh, for the History of Medicine. She will be the one who will introduce properly today's speaker, Peter Wohlleben. And um, before I leave the podium, may I please ask you to silence your phones. Thank you very much. And now please help me in welcoming Dr. Janet Brown. Thank you, Vanessa. You have a procession of people coming up to introduce other people. And so <laughs> perhaps when Peter comes up, he won't, he'll be introducing Vanessa back again. I don't know. So it's, um, very nice to see you all here. Thank you for coming. It's a difficult day for us, uh, for the transit, so thank you very much. Uh, we've got nearly everybody we were expecting, unfortunately, except for our second speaker today. Um, I wanted to say something about um, plant intelligence, certainly something about botany, before we begin, before I introduce our speaker. It seems to be one of the most fundamental ideas in modern biology that plants can never fully be like animals, although they do possess many similar systems and functions. Even from Aristotle's day, uh, with a few notable exceptions, it's been common to describe plants as though they're completely different from animals. And it's often said in justification that plants lack the ability to move and are not able to think. Those are the two questions that we're going to call into, um, or at least certainly the ability to think, is one of the questions we're going to explore together today. And we see these two qualities, um, the inability to move and the inability to think, 
we see this in our own modern popular culture in the um, botanically derived phrases, couch potato, <laughs> and vegging out. <laughs> and I'm sure we all think this is very unjust to plants. <laughs> Even as early as the 17th century, the British botanist Stephen Hales was convinced that plants possessed parallel physiological functions to animals, including growth, respiration, nutrition, and reproduction, although he drew the line at consciousness because he believed with René Descartes that only humans could think. But less than 50 years later, by the time of the great Carl Linnaeus and the 18th century scholar Erasmus Darwin, the responsive movements of plants were top of the research agenda for botanically inclined naturalists, including research into the movements of sensitive plants, such as the mimosa and the insect trapping qualities of the Venus flytrap. And both men, um, Linnaeus and Erasmus Darwin, delighted in shocking contemporary moral values by turning plants into people in their books and personifying, particularly, the vigorous sex life of plants. <laughs> and Erasmus Darwin's conclusion was that the individuals of the vegetable world may be considered as less perfect animals. So similarly, his grandson, Charles Darwin, very much enjoyed elevating plants in the scale of nature. And we know from work of scholars like David Cohn, who's here with us today, and others, that Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection rested on many astonishing botanical investigations made by Darwin, both before and after publication of his Origin of Species. Yet plants, as we're going to hear today, are still the unsung heroes of history and certainly of the evolutionary story. Even at the early age of seven or eight, Charles Darwin convinced a school friend that he could produce variously colored polyanthuses by watering them with different colored fluids, uh, which he said very honestly in his autobiography that this was completely untrue. <laughs> and for the rest of his life, Charles Darwin, like his grandfather Erasmus, was fascinated by the physiology, the movement, the reproduction, the hybridization and the variation of plants. A talented experimenter who loved to explore all the lively living functions of plants that Peter Ayers has recently called their aliveness. The insectivorous sundew, Drosera, Darwin once said to the American botanist Asa Gray, is a wonderful plant, or rather a most sagacious animal and his sense of the beauty, the ingenuity, the adaptive resourcefulness, and even personality of plants is well conveyed in his important botanical writings in the second half of the 19th century. Some of these writings, some of Charles Darwin's botanical writings, were produced with the assistance of his son, Francis, who was another talented botanist in the family line. And Francis, went to Germany to work with the um, very productive plant physiologist, Julius Sachs, on plant movement. And they're still in the archive of uh, the Darwin um, archive in Cambridge in England. They're still in that archive. Francis's research papers um, of his projects with his father on root tip and shoot movements where you can see still on the smoked paper um, traces from, from the, his experiments the wiggling movements of the shoots that were recorded on the smoked paper as an experiment. And these are the 19th century equivalent of what we now see for the movements of roots and shoots in time-lapse photography. So the Darwin family was always ahead 
of the research movements in botanical writings. And we're here today to learn about an important other new frontier in um, plant physiology, in understanding plant activity, plant life. We have a marvelous speaker who will share his research with us into plant lives that are brimming with activity and communication, albeit lives that take place on a time scale rather different from our own. We'll hear how plants are much more sophisticated than we've previously suspected, not just sedentary animals, like Aristotle said, but instead a living indicators of an unknown world of communication. So I'm thrilled to bits to introduce to you Peter Walberden, who's the author of the groundbreaking book, The Hidden Life of Trees, What They Feel, How They Communicate, Discoveries from a Secret World. Um, this book was first published in German in 2015 and is now published in English in 2016. And I hope uh, that you will all see it as you go out into the foyer that it's there on the book table for you to explore. Peter is a forest manager, uh, an academic <laughs> position in Germany. He's not the man who walks around chopping off bits of trees. He's the uh, um, academic manager of a forest near Cologne in Germany, who's introduced important new systems for woodland management that reduce the use of insecticide and the felling of mature individual trees. His efforts are aimed at preserving the forest rather than lumber production. And he takes the perspective of the trees as he'll explain to us today. So, Peter, please, would you join us? So, thank you, Janet, uh, and thank you for the warm welcome. That's not my natural habitat to you. <laughs> you don't look like ants, like in Lord of the Rings. <laughs> So, um, yeah, but it's, it's nice to be here in the botan Botanical Garden and uh, really a, a great honor for me to be here. Um, perhaps uh, I uh, introduce myself a little bit more. Uh, I studied forestry, but that, that was, not, what not, uh, was not the beginning of my nature loving. Uh, it starts uh, at the age of six. And um, I, is something? Ah. The microphone? Ah, sorry. Ah, sorry. <laughs> Better? You see, I'm not used to that. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, at the age of six, I uh, wanted to be a conservationist uh, as a profession, and uh, I didn't know so far that there is a profession like this. Uh, perhaps now it is, but um, I started to keep animals, not, not plants. Uh, animals like spiders or water turtles in a big aquarium, and I started uh, to discover nature by uh, strange th things. For example, uh, when you think about water turtles in an aquarium, you have to change the water every three or four days, yeah, because they, they make it very dirty very soon. And uh, when you don't have uh, a lot of money as a, as a child, you have to bring the water uh, out of the aquarium with a tube by sucking at one end, you know, and uh, bring it right in time out of the window. The other end, when it's not right, not right in time, they make discoveries you don't want to make. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that, that's how it started. And um, uh, yeah, I, I, I uh, breed a chicken on, on the heating pillow of my grandma uh, yeah, because I don't have the money for a breeding machine and I want, want to make the, the experiment that Konrad Lorenz made with the gray goose. Gray goose. Um, you know, the, where the, the um, chicken uh, thought that Conrad Lorenz was their mother. And I thought, okay, I can do that. Uh, when I was around about 12 years or so, I said, okay, I make it. And with the old heating pillow of my grandma, I put an egg on uh, for several days. And yeah, it was a little bit complicated because the heating pillow usually gets too hot. 
and you have to, to put some, some stuff in between and so on. And yeah, one day uh, this, this chicken, uh, um, how do we say, hatched yeah? of, out of the egg. And yeah, really, it th thought I was the mother. And uh, it was really, really funny, but just for three days because uh, you get exhausted when you, when you have a little chicken always at your side because you have to watch your steps and uh, it wants, wants to be w uh, with you everywhere where you go, uh, to the restrooms, in bed, in school. And uh, uh, luckily my, my English teacher adopted this, this uh, chicken uh, several weeks later and it became very old sitting uh, on his shoulder because it thought it was human, yeah. Um, <laughs> then after school I studied forestry because I thought, okay, what to do with my love about nature? And I thought uh, um, a forest manager is something like a tree keeper, which was wrong, which I know now, because a uh, uh, forest manager is something like a tree butcher. And uh, it's okay to, to cut trees for purposes like this floor or books or uh, whatsoever, but in Germany, uh, they say uh, to manage a forest, um, to cut trees, to fell trees, uh, it's good for the forest and to keep it healthy, and that's nonsense, as everyone knows. It's, it's just for us to gain raw material, uh, but not to keep the forest. And, uh, but that's what they tell the people till nowadays, where they say, to be honest. Uh, it's, it's, it's okay to use wood, but it's not okay to say we, we need it to keep the forest healthy. And that's why I changed the forest management. And then I started uh, guided tours in the forest. And uh, the people ask afterwards were always asking, where can we read more about it? Because I don't like boring guided tours where we say, ah, this is this tree, this, this species, because we can uh, detect it on the, on the bark and the, the leaf shape and so on. But instead I say, bite in the leaves. Feel, feel the difference by, by tasting the trees. You, you can, you <laughs> it's really, really funny to do this with the children. They love to go through the forest by tasting trees. And, uh, uh, yeah, and, and I talk about the, the research about communication and family bands, and, uh, and the people ask, uh, they always ask where to read more about it. And uh, my wife said, Peter, please write down, because the people are always demanding it, and I refused for years. And uh, then one, one day I gave, gave up my resistance and said, okay, I write it down and uh, send it to several publishers, and if no one wants to have it, that's it. As you know, it didn't work. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm here now. And uh, my, my wife also is sitting here in the audience. Uh, she's the, uh, the one who's responsible for that flight to New York. And uh, also my agent Lars and his wife Nadja. I call them the tree gang. <laughs> and uh, yeah, okay, that's my, my little story about, about trees and uh, how, I, how I came to this, uh, to this lovely place. So we start with a... Um, Okay, that's the one step far. Um, how we regard trees in general. When we talk about trees, perhaps not you, but in general, we talk about what they are doing for us. They produce oxygen, for example, this is an old beech tree, uh, produce oxygen for 15 people a day. Wow. And uh, produce timber, okay, uh, pu purifies water. But that's exactly what this tree not does. Yeah, this tree exists for uh, 300 million years, uh, mankind since 300,000 years, forest managers since, since 300 years. So trees uh, are used to live on their own. They don't produce anything for us. For example, when you look in this wonderful botanical garden, this, uh, this old um, broadleaf trees, what are they doing now? Yeah, that's just a question. It's not, not a one-way <laughs> conversation. I'm asking you, what, what are they doing now? Pardon? Uh, not the, uh, not, uh, as, uh, as far as I could see, not in the morning. Perhaps there, there is one, but... Uh, hmm? Yeah, sleeping or awaking in the moment. Yeah. Uh, when, when in wintertime, trees don't do nothing. Yeah, we, we say, ah, they, they stand there, okay, and perhaps next spring uh, they, uh, the leaves come out, and what, what, what are they doing in between? They are sleeping. And um, that causes another thing. When they sleep without green leaves, they don't produce oxygen. But they are not dead. What does it mean? They burn sugar in their cells, like we do. It's exactly the same. 
And therefore, they breathe oxygen in and CO2 out. And that's about the healthy forest air in the winter. Yeah? They just produce CO2, no oxygen. And that is it's also not just nothing. They are living, and now they are awaking. And uh, that brings me to the point of the water transport in the tree. Do you know how, the, how it goes? How it, how it works? How, we're, how, does, it, how it, does it work? Huh? Pardon? Transpiration uh, the through the leaves. I love, I love this. Thank you. You belong to me, be honest. Uh, transpiration. Transpiration means uh, the, the water uh, gases out and that then it gets uh, uh, under pressure, is right? Yeah. Uh, and that sucks the water out of the ground. Uh, but what is, what is now going on? For example, think about the, the gaining of maple syrup in the moment. Yeah? The, the trees don't have any green leaf and they are pumping up with water. So there's no transpiration and the water transport is at its highest volume in the moment. The, thicks, uh, the, the stems uh, get thicker to measure that. Or in nighttime, when trees are sleeping too. Yeah, perhaps you have, do you have ever asked yourself what trees are, do, they are doing during nighttime? They sleep. And that's the, one of the reasons why trees, which are standing near a street light, which is burning the whole night long, they die earlier. Yeah, because they can't sleep very good. So um, they are, yeah, that's, we I think, ah, that's too, ah, I've learned this, this crazy word, anthropomorphizing things. Um, uh, but I can't tell you that in tree language. Uh, but we know from researchers from Finland and Austria that uh, they uh, research birch trees, that they lay, let hang their branches at nighttime down, just a little bit. And with sunrise, they go up. Then you may say, ah, that's just a mechanical thing because uh, the stem dries out in nighttime, there's not, not much water, and so the branches hang, hang down. No, it's vice versa. Nighttime, uh, the stem pumps up with water because there is no transpiration. Because there is no transpiration, the stem pumps up, and then when they open their little, uh, I don't know the, the English word for it, little, yeah, which uh, looks like a little mouth, uh, then whoosh, it relaxes and the stem gets a little smaller. And, uh, but uh, um, the, the, the branches go up during daytime. It's, it's not that easy explanation. Uh, but there's, there may be other mechanisms to bring the water up with them. Is there any other explanation besides transpiration? What we often hear is osmosis. Yeah, that, that means that you have uh, different uh, cells with different uh, sugar concentration. And uh, when you have a row of, of cells where, where the sugar concentration and through the membranes between the cells uh, up. But the problem is that in trees, Within, in the tubes, there are no bottoms, there are no membranes. It's, it's like a tube in where you get your water in the house, and you can uh, research it on your, on your own. When you put some soap on, the, on one end of the firewood, you can blow through the other end through and uh, see bubbles coming out. So you can see that, that it is uh, straight through without membranes. So osmosis is also not working. It, it's not detected so far how the water comes up the stem. We don't ask questions because we think ah, it's there and we can read about explanations which, which are not true. You can, you can discover on your own. And that's it, what, what we teach our forest students. Take a look in the forest, not in the books. Yeah. In the books afterwards. And it, 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 there are very good books, <laughs> just to say. But some things are... Uh, they have passed uh, from generation to generation and uh, no one thought about, is it really true? And that, that the water transport is uh, by explained by transpiration is not true, you can, you can see now when you go out. That's the most water in the stems. You, they, they pump up now. They are now awaking. Okay. Um, here are the, the mossy stones that I described in the book. Uh, here you can see it by the uh, beech leaf uh, that, that uh, yeah, four centimeters or so in size. It, that looks like mossy stones, but then it turns out to be remnants of an old stump. And we researched it with students and um, found out that there's uh, green chlorophyll uh, under the bark. That means uh, that it's still alive and it's very hard wood and beech, which is dead, 
that will be rotten very fast. So um, this is uh, uh, a, a remnant of an old stump which is still alive, and it was a diameter of, let's say, one meter and 50. Uh, the, the, it uh, was a very old beech tree which has been felled around about four or 500 years ago. And this stump remnants here are still alive, and they are burning sugar in its cells, and uh, without a green leaf. How does it work? And it turned to be out that this, this old stump is supported by the neighboring trees through the roots with sugar solution. So why do they do that? Any guess? I don't know. It's not research. Why, why? It, it's so, so perhaps without condition. We always think there has to be a reason. Perhaps there is a higher reason for everything. But we, we used to explain nature like a big machine. And everything has its place and has, has to work for, uh, no, it's there. And to support someone without condition, at times like now, it's perhaps unimaginable. <laughs> <laughs> but trees do so, and they don't compete. And that's exactly uh, what, what I was told uh, on university. Trees are competing, and therefore we have to thin them. Yeah, so that the remaining ones have more space to develop healthy, and it's vice versa. Uh, imagine a family of four. You would say, thin the parents. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, but the children have more room <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> and that's exactly, <laughs> but yeah, th that's forestry in Germany, and I think in, in the United States it's very similar. Um, <laughs> Uh, that, that's the explanation, and, and, and it turns out in reality, that's a research from the students uh, of the University of Aachen, that for example, in an in a untouched forest, uh, all trees have the same rate of photosynthesis in their leaves. The same rate, so they, they balance it. Uh, they, they share nutrition th uh, through the roots, and when you thin a forest, you get a lot of lone wolves. And every tree is, is uh, going to work on its own, and so you have trees with a lot of photosynthesis, you have trees with just a little photosynthesis, so you have weak trees that, er, that dies earlier, and the stronger trees live a little bit longer, but not really long, because uh, every tree gets, gets weak and sick one, one day, and when there isn't support from other trees, it will die very early, and very early means after uh, uh, two or 300 years, that's nothing. And we don't know so far how old trees can be. Uh, we were told that um, spruce, for example, can be as old as 250 years. And uh, then, then we went, went around visiting forests and with old trees, and we saw uh, spruce trees which uh, were 500 years old. And we said, wow, how old they are. And then, uh, I think six or seven years ago, they detected um, a, a spruce tree in Sweden, as thick as this, five meters in height, they found out still living uh, around about 10,000 years old. Oh, okay, 20 times older, oh, uh, okay. And at this place, the spruce trees should have returned after the ice age uh, 2,000 years ago, so that's also not true, because it's 8,000 years longer there. Um, and that's, that's uh, I love things like that, that because uh, they show that uh, science is a theory. And good scientists say, that's a theory, that there is, uh, it's most likely that it is like this, but it, it's still uh, a rest of uh, unsureness, and that's exactly the space for new research. But when you say it's proven, it's 100% proven, then no one wants to detect things, and that's about the, the water transport here in the tree. When you say it's proven, it's, it's uh, for inspiration. Okay, so we research other things. Uh, and so I encourage students to, to research the water transport. Uh, okay, what do we see here? That are little beach seedlings. Well, they tell a story. Which one? Yeah, you can see that in the forest. What are they? Huh? Beach, uh, beach seedlings. <laughs> hmm? Yeah, it looks like a bunch, but why? Yeah, yeah, that's the first part of the story, and the second? <laughs> yeah, because it came, didn't come back. Yeah, perhaps of a fox, or perhaps um, 
it, it f uh, forgot the, the, the depot. And that's uh, another point uh, which is, uh, I think, which is really funny. We have, we have a look on nature like a ranking. Uh, we, we divide into humans, into animals, into plants, which is okay, scientifically. But we use it as a ranking. Plants are le less worth than animals. And within animals, we have also a ranking. Um, uh, chimpanzees, for example, they rank very high. Flies rank very low. Even though we know nowadays that, for example, that even fruit flies move their legs while sleeping. If they are dreaming, we don't know. And if so, of what? <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps uh, an old banana? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and the, the, for example, and, uh, we think that uh, we are talking about intelligence, and therefore it's, it's very important uh, what we think about our intelligence. We think intelligent is uh, when, uh, how it is produced. In, in, in the upper layer of our brain, in the neocortex, and every, every animal which is doing it like we do it is intelligent. And so I tell you something about birds and squirrels. Um, the scrub jay, uh, which you also have here, um, it's a raven bird which also stores beech nuts, like, like the squirrel here. Um, birds have a different constructed brain in knots. They're uh, connected very efficient, but uh, decades ago, scientists thought that birds were not that intelligent. Nowadays, uh, many scientists say that they are feathered apes because they are very intelligent. For example, um, yeah, come back to trees afterwards. Uh, uh, ravens, uh, they know uh, amongst each other by name. We, uh, we have discovered so far 80 words, let's say words of their language. And they, they greet their, their friends when they come back after years. Ravens can become very old. They greet them in, in a very high voice. When someone is coming back after years, which they don't like, they greet them in a very low voice. And that's, that's exactly what we are doing. So be careful when you, in, uh, until your next invitation to friends, when they open the door, hear exactly how the tone, uh, the voice is. <laughs> yeah, and that's true. <laughs> Not kidding. Okay, um, when you look at this, uh, this squirrel, a squirrel has uh, the brain in layers like we have with the neocortex, okay? So it's a better one, it should be higher in ranking. And uh, the, the uh, squirrel stores beech nuts, and you can see, uh, yeah, okay, let's, perhaps, let's, let's first say what the scrub jay does. The scrub jay knows exactly where it uh, has stored every beech nut. Uh, where it is, or what is in the depot, perhaps just a, a, um, injured rainworm, which uh, the, the scrub jay injured because it shouldn't move away. And this, the exper experience date of the rainworm is earlier than, uh, than a, of a beech nut, so if it first feeds on this rainworm. And he can, can keep in, in mind all these little uh, details. How many depots, which a lot of details, could you remember for half a year by walking through the botanical garden just once, come back after half a year, and hit this depot on one centimeter. How many would, could you keep in mind? Just a guess, you're competing against a bird <laughs> without layers. <laughs> Just a guess. Three? Three is good. <laughs> Perhaps you can do that with uh, $10 bills because, yeah, it has to be something uh, worthful for you. Um, I think, yeah, perhaps I, I wouldn't find uh, anyone, and uh, any, again. But uh, the scrub jay, I can watch it uh, out of the window of our old forester house. Um, um, it finds it uh, instantly on one pound, one hit, and he uh, gets the depot. Uh, and he can store in, in mind up to 10,000 in this, in this little brain. And then our, our next relative, uh, the squirrel, for the brain in layers, you remember? Yeah, when you, I can watch it also. And then it, it's grabbing here, uh, no. And uh, then it goes to the next point, hmm, okay, no, um, hmm, it wasn't here. Uh, and you can see it sits up and, hmm, where was it? <laughs> and um, that's about ranking. <laughs> and uh, then you see this, this here, yeah, the, the squirrel stuff of hunger. And uh, that's the chance for, for the beach seedlings to become uh, big trees. Uh, when they start, uh, something about time. Um, trees have time, and they need time to grow old. And that's the research being done all over the world. 
Uh, it doesn't matter whether it is in Brazil or in Germany or the United States or Scandinavia. In the first two or three hundred years, they have to grow slow because a slow youth growth causes a high age. And they can become very old when they don't use their complete energy and the youth for growing. So they have to be patient. They are not, they are not patient. Young, young trees are not patient. Uh, they, they want to grow. And as soon as they get light, they grow as fast as they can. And therefore, the old mother tree brings a deep shadow on the little ones. Just 3% of the sunlight reaches the seedlings, and they have to wait two, two to 300 years. And to be honest, uh, a tree with, uh, with this, which is uh, 300 years old, you would guess, wow, very old. No, that's a kindergarten. And um, you can see it here the, on the knots on the branch here, each knot represents one year of growth. Yeah. This, this branch here is uh, 15 years old. And that's exactly the speed how trees should grow in the first uh, centuries. Um, in, in, uh, I can show it here. Here's a 150 years old beech tree. That's the mother tree here uh, at the side. And, um, it's very hard to, to make the shadow uh, matching perfect. When it is too dark, the, the little one will die. And therefore, uh, the little one is connected through the roots with the mother tree. Now you can say, ah, that's an automatic process. A mother tree which, which cares for its offspring, that's a little bit too, too anthropomorphizing. Yeah? And, uh, but it, it turns out trees have, like many other plants, um, brain-like structures in their, their root tips. There are brain-like processes going on. And they know exactly, ah, is this a beech tree? Is this a family member? Ah, my own seedlings. The, it's a research from the University of Vancouver. Um, Dr. Suzanne Zimmer, uh, she, she researched on that by um, radioactive marked sugar molecules. And you can see where they go through. And uh, she also found out that that mother tree uh, don't take much water out of the soil surrounding the seedling in dry summers so that the seedling uh, gets enough water. Yeah, so are trees conscious? Uh, there's a, an interesting paper in the New York Times, I think three weeks ago. Perhaps you read it about uh, sedating plants. Sedating plants, okay. It's um, a German professor from the University of Bonn, Fantisek Paluska, and he, uh, he sedated plants with narcotics also used on animals and humans. And the plants react similar. Plants are also working uh, on electrical signals they slow down, and when the um, narcotics are gone, the plants do what? Hmm. Yeah, they, they start with their activity, but what is it? Do they awake? And the uh, interviewer uh, asked exactly that question, are plants conscious? And the professor gave, gave uh, the best answer he could. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that. Okay, um, here's another, another example of things going on in plants, in, in trees. Just have to look, ah, I'm good in time, uh, because otherwise I would talk for, for hours. Um, this is an oak tree, and this oak tree has these little branches here, uh, which uh, very th uh, thin ones, not the, th the, the thick ones, doesn't count, but the little ones here. Um, this uh, oak tree is surrounded by young beech trees. Yeah, like a street gang, and they are going to kill this oak. Um, and they, they uh, grow with their roots under the uh, oak roots, put away water and nutrition. They grew uh, with their uh, branches through the crown of the oak and switch the light off so that uh, the oak can't produce sugar anymore. And this oak panics. Yeah, and that's a uh, technical term. It's uh, this, this uh, no, no, not panic. <laughs> what I wanted to say. Uh, These this branches are called fear branches. Yeah, this is a technical term for force. Uh, fear branches, so everyone sees uh, this oak is going to die uh, in the next years. And it's, it's nonsense to build these fear branches because when there's not a li uh, not li uh, um, light on the top of the crown, then there's no light uh, below it. And it's even less light. It's, it's, it's nonsense to waste energy to produce new branches. And they, they, these branches die, and the oak will die too within 10 years. Yeah, it's a panic reaction. And when we are uh, in panic, 
we also make nonsense, and even trees. Ah, yeah, that are the three oaks which I described in the book. Uh, the drop off of the leaves in autumn is not an automatic process. Plants are no robots, and uh, they are individuals. They have different characters. Why not? On animals, we know that. Uh, think about dogs and cats. You won't say oh, they are robots. They are all, all equal, uh, working every day the same. No, they are different, and trees also. They are on the same space, uh, the same soil, same water, same temperature. Here's uh, direction south, so they have the same light. Trees have to, um, broadleaf trees have to drop off their leaves because in wintertime when there's a heavy snow, the branches can break down and that's uh, very dangerous for trees. That hurts. Come to that topic later, that trees can feel pain. And uh, the question is when to drop it off because um, when, when the harsh frost comes, then all trees fell immediately into a sleep. And then it's not longer possible to drop off the leaves and they have to keep them the whole winter time. You can see that sometimes in a park or in your garden that trees keep the brown leaves. They are a bit too late then. <laughs> and um, yeah, the question is, when sh should a tree drop off the leaf? A tree can feel the season like you, like you do. You don't have to look in the calendar. You go out and you see, ah, it's warm, it's, the day length is increasing, ah, it's spring. Perhaps not now, <laughs> not today. Uh, and um, a tree can also feel um, the temperature, can also see the day length. And um, in, in autumn is the question, when shall I drop the leaves off? And the, the more careful tree or more fearful like here, say, ah, last October, mid of October, we had a, a first heavy snowfall, let's drop the leaves earlier. And this one here is perhaps a little bit more tough. Say, ah, we always had a golden October, can produce a little bit more sugar. And, um, uh, by the way, uh, do, you have, do you ever uh, thought about how trees go to the restrooms? <laughs> yeah, but a tree is like a big elephant. It's, it's, it's producing a lot, it's consuming a lot, uh, like we do, like elephants do, and we all know how it works on elephants, do we? <laughs> okay, yeah, there's no question, but on trees? And there you see the categories. Yeah, the ranking, trees, okay, but it's a little bit like a stone. Stone also don't need to go to the restroom. And, but a tree is a little bit more than a stone. It's more like an elephant. It's just a little bit slower. Okay, so it produces a lot of things which, uh, which a tree has to get rid of. So a tree has to go to the restrooms. Perhaps not to walk, yeah, but uh, yeah. How does a tree do, the, do it? A tree is pumping uh, the, all the things uh, it doesn't need into the leaves. And then it drops them off. Yeah, before it, it, it takes out uh, chlorophyll and other, other substances, then it, uh, when the things uh, trees doesn't need, let's say it like this, uh, it pumps into the leaves. I don't know if therefore the color of the leaves afterwards is brown, I don't know. <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> Uh, always remember, when you're walking through a, a, a fall uh, forest, uh, you're walking through tree toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, here you see uh, that, that there are different characters in a, in a hedge. Um, it's an average tree, it's a more fearful one, a tough one. You can see it in, in, in fall exactly on, on your hedge that uh, the trees have different characters. And they are able to learn. I have to scroll a little back. Um, trees have a memory. Ah, surprise. That seems necessary when you want to become hundreds of years old that you collect experiences. And here you can see the little ones here. That's a photo from Indo. I have to say that it's just leech out from the photo. The, the trees are not cut or sick or whatsoever because sometimes people say, oh, what a, what a uh, weak forest. No, no, it's just because of the photo. Um, here you see the little ones. They have their brown leaves on. That means they dropped it, them off too late. That is, uh, uh, that is by purpose. Uh, think about a human family. The mother says, children, go to bed. Yeah, okay, we do so. Yeah, and the mother tree, in this case, uh, dropped off the leaves, and then the little ones are standing in full sunlight. Wow. And they can go to bed with sweets. They produce sugar. Uh, they produce sugar, and they keep their leaves on. And the, the, the point is that when we have afterwards uh, uh, hard frost, then they can't drop off their leaves. But that doesn't matter because 
the little thin uh, seedlings, they can bend when the snow falls and they go up when the snow is melting. It's no problem. As, but, but in the moment when the, the stem becomes a little bit thicker, then the wood cracks inside. And that hurts. And the tree realized that. And from this year on, it drops off uh, the leaves together with the mother tree. You can see uh, this one is doing a little like the mother tree, and the little ones here in the background, they haven't experienced that pain so far. And you can see it when we walk through the forest. OK, that's about pain. What is pain? Pain is a, a reaction every being uh, has to feel. For example, we are always uh, saying we are working on mind. When we say, when we compare it with animals, we say animals are working on instincts or reflex. And uh, that's also a ranking. But it's, it's, in reality, it's not a ranking. When you think about what is most worthful, worthful in your life, uh, compressed in just one word, what would you say? What would you choose? What is most important in your life? One word. Just had this one opportunity to say. <laughs> yeah, think careful. <laughs> Just one word. What would you choose? What is most important in your life? <coughs> Love? Helps. Yeah. Helps? <laughs> yeah, uh, I had a little bit more time to think about it. I, I would choose happiness because when you are happy, you, uh, you have love, you have your family, what, what is important for you, but you can also choose love when you love or uh, you are beloved, then life is, is rich. And that are emotions. And emotions are the drivers of instincts. They're not for your mind, they, uh, that's vice versa. They, they are just there to, to um, how do you say, when you, they, they want to, don't want that your mind uh, take part of your decisions. And that, that are uh, instincts and that are emotions. When you love someone, it's with, without your mind. You can reflect that, that's another thing. But uh, the emotions are working without your mind. That's most important. And um, why shouldn't other beings uh, work like this? For example, mother love, one of the, the strongest emotions, is caused by many hormones, uh, for example, oxytocin. In oxytocin you can also find in goats, in horses, and even in goldfish. So, okay, goldfish that loves? We don't know so far, but you know that they have oxytocin in their blood. Um, when you come back to the tree, when a tree gets hurt by a bark beetle, uh, then the tree is able to to taste by the saliva which, which beetle it is. Ah, this bark beetle, okay. And then there is going a reaction on. You can measure electrical signals within the tree, which are very slow moving. Maximum speed is one uh, centimeter per second. Yeah, that's that's uh, perhaps the, the reason why, why we don't understand trees. For example, our signal from the feet to the brain is going in two milliseconds. So a tree is several thousand times slower. And remember that when you're a tree hugger, for example, yeah? and you, you expect an answer from the tree. <laughs> yeah, but that's relaxing. If, if you take hours or days, it's okay huh? if there is an answer. I, I don't think so, but uh, if you expect an answer, take your time. Uh, for, for trees, uh, that's a problem um, because they want to warn their uh, surrounding companions of the same species. Um, that's, proven, uh, for, um, that's proven that tr trees surrounding the, the uh, attacked tree, they react exactly the same. Uh, that takes, it depends on how the signal uh, is transported. When it is transported through the root system, electrical and chemical, then it takes hours. But uh, sometimes trees, or in many times, uh, they um, bring uh, chemical signals th through their leaves and the wind is much faster than the tree and brings it to the neighboring trees, but just to the trees which are standing in the wind, and not uh, the trees in the other direction. Therefore, it is necessary to have a root signal also, but it's, it's, it's uh, much slower. But uh, in general, the reaction is the same. Electrical signal, reaction, defending reaction, and the defending reaction is different. That's a research from the University of Leipzig. They found out that um, when a deer bites in a, a, a branch from a little beach, the little beach can, um, can taste the saliva of the deer and then uh, a depending reaction goes on. And when the scientists pruned branches, then uh, the, the tree began uh, with a wound healing reaction. 
So the tree knows the difference. Perhaps not the scientist, <laughs> what the scientist is, but uh, perhaps uh, the tree just know, ah, that's not a deer. <laughs> yeah. But uh, a tree uh, knows, can recognize what's going on around. And uh, when you see, come back to yourself, um, what's going on with your mind and your, your emotions and instincts and re uh, reflex, uh, you can, can see what, what is most important. For example, when your mind would be uh, more important in your life and your mind would be uh, responsible for all, then you would have problems. For example, you put your hand on a hot oven and your mind would, would be responsible for the reaction. Then you would say, hmm, it's smelling like barbecue. <laughs> yeah? yeah, that's your mind. And then you look around and say, yeah, there's smoke in the kitchen. And then you look at your, yeah, you don't feel anything because that are instincts and emotions. Uh, if, you, if you look at your, your hand and see, oh, wow, it's, it's on the hot oven and then it's damaged. So, and wounded. And uh, your, your instincts would say, or your flicks, put it away. And afterwards, your mind would say, shit. <laughs> That's your mind. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> I don't know if a tree reflects the pain, that's something different, but that it feels pain, I think that's, that's the question is what is pain? But we have so many words not, not, uh, um, where we don't have good definitions. For example, uh, when you uh, think about thinking, there are several uh, definitions about thinking, what thinking is, what language is. We use uh, expressions like that uh, without thinking about what does they really mean. But we are very often very sure that other beings they can't do that. <laughs> they can't think. Uh, what it is? Yeah, okay. Ah, here's a mushroom from the fungi network. We say uh, we, we, we've found this. We, found, we, we haven't found the fungi. We, we have just found the fruit. Do we have, ever, do we have uh, um, imagination why uh, we, we can uh, harvest or found, find the most mushrooms in autumn? There's a reason. Pardon? It's not the whole yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's just the fruit, yeah. But why in, why in autumn? Why do, uh, do they come out in, in autumn? Not in spring. Most species, not all, but. Yeah, they, they um, I, I, I hope I get your answer right. It's because it's payday. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the fungi network get, get paid for its duty. And um, it's a payday is, is at a time when the trees have enough sugar produced. And uh, uh, fungi is not able to, to feed itself. Uh, it's, it's so it's closer to animals and than to plants. So far it's, it's not really, really researched. Uh, there are related organisms, uh, it's not the fungi, it's a, uh, one uh, cell uh, organism, it's uh, uh, called slime mold. I think you don't know, you know slime molds, those uh, yellow things. One cell organism, uh, slime molds, they, they like old, old flakes. They really like old flakes, and when you put them in a labyrinth, uh, this slime mold is able to move, yeah, very slow. If you have a, a smartphone with a time-lapse uh, function, you can make a little film for half an hour or so, and you can see it move. And uh, one cell, a singular cell organism, um, and uh, it's able to make its way out of the labyrinth on the shortest way, uh, by try and error and remember the errors. It's a singular cell organism. And we always, when we say the, the, the picture of ranking, uh, we always judge uh, organisms by their brain size, by the amount of neurons. But that's not the point. And it's not proven so far how, how our brain really works. For example, um, we have billions of neurons and how they work, that's good, good research so far, but it's not researched uh, or there's no result uh, how it works. All those billions of neurons, how they work together and say when you look in the mirror in the morning, ah, that's me. Yeah. There's billions of neurons working together and but how it works, we don't know. Um, this um, mushroom is, is a fruit of the fungi network, and the fungi network offers its duty. And uh, as we all learned in, sh in school and, and during studying biology and whatsoever, is the mycorrhizum, uh, mycorrhiza things, uh, the, the, how they work together to get more water and nutrition out of the ground. It's interesting, but I'm more interested in the information network. 
which is going from tree to tree. There, this this uh, fungi network is not always all, um, only transportation uh, transports uh, news from one tree to another, for example, from a, um, a bark beetle attack or a deer attack or whatsoever, but also sugar from one, one tree to another. Um, and this fungi network gets paid for these uh, duties, and, uh, but it's not always doing what it should, like our internet. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to mention some, uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> for example, um, uh, this, the, the fungi are, uh, they, they uh, need the beech trees uh, to get paid. But perhaps uh, one day a disease will kill all beech in this area. So it's better to have a plan B. And that can mean oaks. And therefore, sometimes the oaks also get a little bit sugar and if the, the uh, bee tree will die one day, then the, um, the fungi network um, has its, its oaks uh, to feed on. So, um, the, per, the, but that's just a guess. We know how the, the sugar is flowing from tree, tree to tree, but not why uh, fungi are doing this. But I think uh, it's clever to have several options and that makes uh, the rich biodiversity of a forest. Uh, so, uh, we don't have to fear that uh, one day one tree species will overtake the whole forest and form something like a monoculture. Uh, that's nonsense. Um, therefore, there are other organisms like fungi which are interested in a more uh, rich biodiversity among trees. But uh, beech trees are, are, uh, don't love this, as I showed in the picture before, with the oaks which are, uh, are under attack. Yeah, uh, perhaps besides, um, as, as uh, plant lovers, garden lovers, uh, you know that. I, I, I think um, it's always funny thinking about the color of a forest. If beech trees or other trees uh, would be able to tell th something about color, they would say, we hate green. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's not good saying this when, while you're green, but uh, uh, green is something like uh, a, a waste, waste uh, wa uh, waves of the light. Uh, trees are, are interested in blue and red and yellow. Therefore, uh, beside that, uh, those red colored, uh, how do you say, in Germany we would call it blood uh, maple or blood beech with a red colored um, uh, leaves, but that's a breed. Uh, for some garden lovers, that looks nice, but uh, in reality, trees are this are a handicap because they can produce uh, full uh, sugar, uh, uh, they waste they uh, waste red light and that's not good. In the forest, you see something sometimes red seedlings, but they disappear until fall because they are not able to compete. Uh. Okay, uh, those trees in the street. Uh, this is here something like Frank uh, Frankenstein here. Uh -huh. yeah? <laughs> there are two different, two diff even two different species. It's a uh, uh, I don't know the, the English word, but it's a cherry from, I think, from Japan. Uh, and and th this is here um, put on uh, another stem from another species. Because we think, ah, that's faster and we want to have exactly this picture. Uh, but here you can see that they don't like each other. They are fighting against each other, but they can't live without each other. And that's uh, not the perfect situation, let's say it like this. We have another problem in, in streets. Um, general in gardens, when you plant a tree, an apple tree, for example, uh, who of you have ever planted an apple tree? How tall was it? Yeah, so like this. Um, how big was, was the root ball you get in the garden center? With this broomstick? <laughs> oh, well, that's, that's, even, that's really big. In general, it's more like this, but you got a big one, okay? But that's not uh, as big as it should be. Why uh, is the root system pruned by gardeners? Why? Hmm? For transportation, yeah, because otherwise your car would go up when you put it in the rear. Uh, the, the, the root system of a tree like this should have a diameter of four or five meters. It's, it's a really big, big root system. You can't put out this complete root ball, so you damage the root tips, you cut them off. And what happens to us when someone would cut our brain-like structures? You could imagine. Uh, on trees, it's the same. Um, there is, um, they will restore a root system, but not in the same quality. 
And trees with a cut, a cut root system won't root deep anymore. So they can be thrown by storms uh, more easily. So they are damaged. And what, what I have uh, uh, researched and uh, seen many times in, in uh, for, uh, forests which were planted, you don't find this uh, interaction between trees. For example, those stumps which get uh, help from other trees. Uh, it, it's something like a herd of lone wolves which you have in those forests because of those damaged uh, root systems. And th therefore, if you have the opportunity to, to, uh, uh, to bring a tree in the garden, then I always would uh, like to grow a tree out of a seed. It takes more time, and that's exactly the, the, the point. Yeah, uh, we are always in a hurry and we want to have uh, results, uh, and yeah, it has to go fast, but that's not tree speed. Uh, trees are very slow, and they have to take their time, and then they can become very healthy. And it's to okay for you, and I have also planted apple trees, <laughs> just to say that, uh, because I'm always something uh, in a hurry. But um, yeah, but it's, it's for us. It's always important to know that. You don't have to prune trees for the trees. That's also a thing, because that hurt trees. Do you know the best time uh, for pruning trees? If you want to do so? No. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, the best time is uh, July or August, when the trees are awake, because in winter time they can't uh, heal their wounds. You know, they have them open for half a year. It, I, it is done in winter time because you can, uh, on broadleaf trees, you can see through the ground. Uh, the, uh, you can see uh, through the crown. You can see where the branches are crossing and things like that. But uh, for the tree, if you want to prune it, it's best in summertime. Late summertime, it's the best time. Uh, yeah. Oh, do we have time? I don't know. Okay, uh, we have time, but I can uh, put it in the dialogue, so it's... It's nice for the people to ask you questions. Yeah, okay. So, um... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, it's up to you to ask questions. <laughs> It's great to know how they feel. It's been really interesting to hear you speak to this uh, with so much experience. And we've had questions um, given in by the audience, and I am um, uh, um, prioritizing them. I, I'm not filtering them, but I am um, trying to represent your points of view in the questions to, to our speaker. And there's been a number of questions delivered by the members of the audience about terminology. So uh, you spoke a little about the problems of anthropomorphizing. Um, and I, I, I'm asking whether using the word intelligence, are you meaning to suggest that plants, and particularly trees, are conscious? Thank you. Are conscious like animals or like us? I realize it's a difficult question. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. something that has come quite a lot. Um, it's a terminology. Yeah. It's, it, it's, yeah, exactly. It's a question, what, what is conscious? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what is conscious, but uh, in, the, in the way that we think that, that you can reflect emotions or just feelings, uh, I would say yes. Uh, because otherwise, uh, how it is uh, possible for, for a tree to have different reactions, for example, on different seedlings, mm -hmm. when it is an automatic reaction. And we, have, we know that, um, for example, that uh, trees form something like couples. It's not happened very often, uh, perhaps in one to 50 cases, because when you drop down as a seed, yeah, you have to grow where you are. When, uh, when near you drop something you or not, yeah, you think, I don't like this guy here beneath, uh, near me, then that it's over for the next 500 years. So uh, uh, you have to be very lucky to, to, uh, to get a match, and, uh, but then they form uh, lifetime couples very strong together, and when you cut one of those trees, that's well known to foresters, uh, when you cut one of both trees, the other one will die in the next years too. Like an old couple where the other remaining ones say, oh, I don't want to live anymore. So you ask about consciousness, I don't know. I don't know, to be honest, but I, 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 my guess is, yeah, yes. 
Okay, thank you. So uh, there's a related question to that, um, that perhaps uh, you did actually mention the internet. Um, so we do live in a computer age, and um, information processing and handling decentralized data is very familiar to us on our screens. Are we perhaps entering a world, do you think we're entering a world where this data processing is something that trees are doing and, and that our internet minds yeah. can mm. help them um, and see, and see, see where, where, where the problem is, mm -hmm. uh, because we are uh, still comparing uh, living beings with machines. Okay. Yeah, yeah it, it's it's good uh, good to mention that because uh, uh, it's, it uh, reduces also our our feelings and and uh, our life uh, to something like a like a complicated computer, and uh, I think there there is more. I'm I'm convinced that a, that a computer, for example, has never been able to to have real emotions. Yeah, and uh, but uh, to come back to your question, <laughs> uh, how um, to to compare it to a computer? There, um, there is a guess from several scientists. I spoke to a, a Polish first professor, and he said his guess is that the the root tips are all working together like a computer cloud, because they they were all searching where is the memory of trees. Mm. They don't have a brain like we have. Uh, we know that for for sure. But for example. Uh, apple trees, uh, that's, that's a research also from Germany, they can count. They count warm days in spring. And just when there's a, 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 a certain amount of warm days achieved, then they come out with their blossom and, and leaves because they don't want to freeze, uh, to have them frozen. And uh, the question is, uh, when they count, they, uh, they had to have to have a memory because otherwise they would count every day one. Yeah. <laughs> but where it is? We don't know. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Um, may I turn to something a little more personal that um, you've been asked by a member of our audience about what have trees taught you? Uh, yeah, tr uh, trees uh, have uh, taught me patience. Um, because uh, nowadays we are thinking we are uh, mankind is destroying nature. But that, that's not the case. I can assure you, uh, we can't destroy nature. We can destroy our environment. That's more important for us in the moment, but uh, you can't destroy nature. For example, uh, in 30 or 40,000 years, we will have the next ice age rolling over this wonderful botanical garden with uh, th uh, two miles of ice. And afterwards, it will be restored. Yeah, it's, a, it's a question of time, but we don't have that time nowadays. So, so it's our environment that we are destroying. Thank you. It would be wonderful to have the patience of a tree. Yeah. Yes, thank you. So a number of people also, and myself too, uh, are very anxious um, to hear your views on how we can improve the health of our trees, the trees in the city. Yeah. Um, you spoke of a cemetery of trees and you spoke of the light, keeping them awake all night. Is there something we can do to help trees? The best uh, you can do on trees is leave them on their own. Uh, it, it's, uh, yeah, I think um, it, it's uh, typical for Homo sapiens that we all try to do something good. And then we feel well. Mm. But uh, in this case, it's best to do nothing. Uh, and when you, when you, for example, trees in cities are important for us. And for, for okay, for trees, it's also not that bad because. Uh, the chance to come uh, out, to become a big tree out of a seedling, the chance is one to two million on, on beech nuts. And when you go to willows or to um, aspen, for example, the chance is one to one billion to become, you know, that one seed becomes a really big tree. So uh, being a tree in a city is perhaps like winning the, the second prize. <laughs> so, and uh, it's, not the, yeah, it's not the best environment for a tree. If you want, want to help a tree, you don't prune it. You, you, uh, in the city, it's, it's even harder to find uh, space for the roots and things like that. All you can do in, uh, concerning this is good, but uh, it's, it's really good uh, uh, to have trees in cities and to have the connection between people and trees. Thank you. Um, they give us asthma. They often give us um, breathing difficulties yeah. when they're seeding. So should we be choosing trees that um, are less reproductively active? 
Yeah. <laughs> I don't oh. know how else to put it. No, yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, it, it, we should be careful which, which mm. trees we, we choose because um, in general, uh, trees in cities are uh, usually um, uh, something like pioneers, mm. uh, which are not, not the, the, the end uh, state of our forest ecosystem when they are stable. Like birch trees, for example, they are very aggressive with their pollen. Uh, and uh, that usually they don't belong to our surrounding forests. And I don't know if, if this is the reason, but we are not used to that. And so it's perhaps not the best idea to plant birch trees in, in, in cities, but instead mm -hmm. what, what we see here surrounding it, oaks are good, uh, beech trees are good, uh, um, maples are good, and so on. So we have a, a rich choice of, of trees uh, of this region, I would, always take native trees because we, we see uh, ah, a tree. It's like, like a furniture. And, uh, but there are so many other organisms belonging to this tree and we should support uh, native organisms from the surrounding trees in the cities. The city is not a bad place for nature. The rocks are shaped a little bit strange for animals, yeah? <laughs> in the straight way, but, but uh, nowadays we have Many, many uh, species in cities and they feel well there and we can support them by planting native trees. Mm. Yeah. Um, so we're a New York audience and we want to know what you might think about the ginkgo being so <laughs> prevalent in our streets. Yeah. Why do pe uh, does people choose ginkgo? It's the, mm -hmm. the, the little uh, tail which is connected. Ah, it seems to be it seemed to be extinct and it's a tree from the time age of the dinosaurs and things like that. Uh, it's a beautiful tree, yes. but it, it, it doesn't belong to here. It's good to have it in the botanical garden to, to show what, uh, what trees are growing all over the world. Uh, that's a good place. But I wouldn't choose it for the garden or for the streets. Besides, uh, they don't smell very good. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> They're blooming, you know that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry we got a number of questions coming up. Yeah. I hope you don't mind all this. Um, so here's a sort of political question for you. Given your very specific expertise and role and, and knowledge of the role that trees play in our world, is there some advice that you would like to give governments? Uh, <laughs> of course, you've spoken to us about what we should do as individuals, but is there something that you would advise um, Western governments to engage yeah, in? I think, uh, I don't know if the, if the, if the, the question games on, on uh, ecological mm. advice. Mm. Uh, Log logging. Hmm? What about logging? Yeah, lo uh, is the um, question. in, in, in yes. Germany, for example, I can. I think it's it's here. It's the same. Uh, we think that the use of wood is carbon neutral, mm -hmm. which is nonsense. It's it's as good as coal, in burning, for the climate. And uh, when you do want to do something for nature, it's exactly what I said on trees. It's the best to keep your hands in your pockets. If you need it, if you need f uh, firewood, it's okay to to fell a tree because it's for you. But when, if you want to do something for the environment, you have to keep it on its own. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, the best thing you can do. For example, it's a research, I think, one and a half year ago from Brazil, that the, um, there was an ancient native uh, culture which uh, went away with the uh, appearance of the uh, European settlers the, around the year 1500. And uh, since then, the Amazon rainforest recovered in, in a way that we think today it's a primeval forest region. In, in many parts, it is not. And it recovered that strong uh, that, uh, that's a guess from the scientists, um, they uh, guessed that the, it may trigger the little ice age in the, in the um, year 16, 16, 17 hundreds. Uh, the recovery of the Amazon rainforest triggered the, the um, temperature, the cool down of two degrees. And that's exactly what we are talking about nowadays. One and a half, two degrees, perhaps three. Uh, let trees do the job on their own. They can do it. Okay, thank you very much. So could we look at this perhaps through a non-Western lens? Um, we've had a question from the floor about the um, Native American Indian way of looking at nature. Yeah. I myself had made a note as you were speaking about the Bengali plant physiologist Chandra Bose, mm -hmm. who um, also thought about nature in a more holistic way. Mm -hmm. So the, the question is, um, if we had a bigger view, uh, um, a holistic vision mm -hmm. of nature, would we be able to adopt ideas of plant intelligence a little more easily? Uh, I think so, and I think we are not uh, that far away from this point, uh, mm -hmm. because we always, th always th think nowadays the, the 
what do you say, the, the, the band, the ribbon between us and nature has been cut? And it's not true. We are, mm. we are still part of nature and uh, look around. You are all nature lovers, tree lovers. Uh, we, we are not evil. And uh, I think we don't need new moral standards because every one of, of you has, had it, has it inside your heart. It's, I think uh, nowadays politics are, is, are, politicians are a little bit slow, perhaps in tree speed, coming behind the, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the general mood of the population because I, I don't, I haven't met, met people uh, which say I, it, it, I doesn't care for nature. There are some, but uh, in general, I think most people are uh, a step uh, more forward than, than politicians. That's perhaps the main problem, that they think you won't protect nature or won't spend a little money for, for protection. I think uh, I, I don't see that big problems in, in future. Perhaps we have a time problem, a little type time problem, but I'm optimistic in that. Okay, thank you. And here's a question that please feel free to say n no. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so one of us wishes to know, have you ever had a direct communication from a tree? Ah, uh, okay. Hmm. No. Uh, surprisingly, every one of you have. Mm. You can smell it when you're in, a, in a, a, a communication, okay, when it means both way, you know that it's, it's just a one-way communication from the tree to me or you. Uh, when you go through a healthy, healthy forest, your blood pressure sinks. Yeah? Ah. You can measure that. That's, that's research from Japan and South Korea, and in Germany they start research on this now. Um, because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's like a medicine. It's, it's yeah. Mm. Everyone knows that it's good to go through the forest, but what it really uh, man means to your body, it, it's, uh, there's good research on that. Uh, and when you go through a forest which is uh, weak, well, for example, in Germany, the conifer forests, which don't belong there, they are always weak, it's too dry and too hot for them there. And you can smell that and on a hot summer day, this aromatic smell in conifer forests. Yes. Yeah, that is street yes. communication. Yeah. Yeah, so oh. you don't have to be esoteric uh, when you say, hey, I've communicated with trees. Not perhaps just, or, or I, I listen to trees, let's say, like this. Okay, well that's sim simply fascinating. So really, um, one of the messages of your wonderful book is that we sh it's us that's the problem. We should rethink the way we address the natural world. Yeah, and and I think we, it's, yeah. it's uh, important to say uh, trees are not the better humans, mm -hmm. which I read somewhere. Uh, no, and we can, we can, uh, we we, we uh, are, let's say, allowed to say that we are more important. But I think every species would 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 say if it could talk like this to us, I am more important than you. For example, when you, when you met a lion in, in the African savanna, just you and the lion. I think, and the lion is hungry. Yeah, if you may, uh, may guess who, 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 who you think this is more important. It's, it's, uh, I think it's okay to have this point of view, but it's not okay to make a ranking between our other species, species which are evolutionary nearer to us, like monkeys or our pets, uh, in comparison to, to flies or whatsoever. When it leaves your garden and your home, then there should be no ranking. In your home, it's okay, a dog is a family member, we have, uh, our family has also two dogs, they are family members, they rank very high. But when we leave our garden, then flies, crows, horses, whatsoever, that is uh, all equal to me. Okay, thank you. So just turning back to yourself again, I wondered if there was some special moment that you'd like to share with us. Because uh, uh, during university times, uh, we were told that trees are competing. And when I saw this, I thought, but why is this uh, gets this old stump support from neighboring trees? Why, why do they support competitors? It's crazy. And, and then I thought, oh, perhaps it isn't a competitor. And that was uh, where, when I started thinking about how trees are really working and uh, that trees are forming big, big uh, communities, big family uh, bands. For example, uh, that, that makes sense uh, because uh, they, they sweat together in summer. A big beech tree can... Uh, um, uh, have uh, transpiration uh, uh, in, in the amount of 500 liters of water uh, each day on a hot summer day. And remember, thousands of beech trees uh, are sweating like this. Uh, they cool down together, they, they have their own microclimate, and they are interested in keeping as many as members as possible of this society. And that, 
Uh, yeah, that was uh, the, the, the tho thoughts mm. I, I get when I saw this old stump. Yeah. I'm glad you began your talk with that. Thank you. Um, so science often seems to progress by jumps and starts. And um, from reading your book, I can imagine you as a prophet of a new way of thinking about plants in general. Um, it's a very difficult position to put you in, but would you have some comments on, are we moving into a new phase in f the way we think about plants? Yeah, I think we, we are really uh, already in, because when you read this scientific report, which I cited from, the, from sedating plants, mm -hmm. who would ever have thought about sedating plants, uh, nor about a, a result of all of this. So I think we're, uh, the, the scientists have moved since let's say 10 or 20 years in, in, a, in a very good direction. But the, the only problem is the language of the scientific reports. <laughs> I think yeah. that's, that's yes. the main problem. So that, that most people hadn't uh, recognized that, that scientists had made wonderful discoveries and that they have, a, a meanwhile, a wide view on nature like Charles Darwin. Uh, so perhaps it was just uh, way bes uh, on the left and on the, on the right and now we are in a direction in the same way. Yeah. And uh, that's perhaps one of my tasks to uh, translate those uh, reports into lay person's language so that everyone can, can read it. Well, thank you. I have two or three rather short questions, if you wouldn't yeah. mind, and yeah. then I think we should probably wrap up and move into the next phase of our morning. Yeah. But um, there's a couple of short questions here. Uh, do flowers hear and communicate? Do flowers communicate? Uh, what about once they're cut in a vase? Um, um, we are, um, the, the research uh, which was done so far is, is just on, on some species because mm -hmm. it's, it's a, 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 a new research. Um, we know that, for example, that, um, on, um, that wheat seedlings are uh, communicate by sound. Now they make click noise uh, in the uh, frequency of 200 hertz. And the, and the other seedlings are growing with their roots into this direction. We don't know why they are doing this. That's, that's research from Australia, the University of Perth, I think. Um, it's, it's, uh, we, when when uh, scientists dis discover one thing, there are 10 new questions. That's the problem. Perhaps that's the, the, the nice thing because uh, that shows that we won't come to an end with uh, new discoveries. And that's what, what makes life so, so rich. But uh, in this state, we know that, that plants are able to make uh, 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 noises with that they, that there is a reaction of the same uh, species beside. Uh, and uh, some scientists think that most plants are communicating. Perhaps uh, you've uh, wondered why you're, when, you're, when you have um, a garden with a little farmland, why you have always fight wild plants. Why, and why your domesticated plants are always losing without help. Have you ever thought about it? Because they were breed strong, fast growing, strong. They should, uh, they should overwhelm the, the, the wildflowers without any problems. But why are always wildflowers winning? You've ever thought about that? Because it's crazy, because we, we've breed the, the domesticated plants to grow very fast, so they should be better. And uh, one reason may be that many of the uh, domesticated plants have lost the ability to communicate. Oh. So they are on their own. Yeah. And, it's, and that's a good, good message or uh, that, and the one question w which you ask, what about politicians? What can they learn about things like that? They can learn about that we are just strong together. And when we fall apart and, and with, with nationalism and things like that, that's always a bad idea, even on plants. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Janet, you had a last remark? I just wish to thank you so much for being very kind and answering these impossibly difficult questions. <laughs> um, you've given us a wonderful talk, thank and you. I'm deeply grateful, and so is our audience. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all for coming this morning. I want you to know that the questions which were not discussed here will be kept and looked at carefully. 
and maybe we will am sending to them to you and we will get in touch with you somehow to have those answers yet or perhaps there will be another book. <laughs> the yes. Hidden what trees after idea. talking in the New York Botanical Garden. So <laughs> there will be a book signing. Uh, Janet Brown will have her books out in Darwin. There's three different kinds, all very interesting. And of course, Peter Wolleben will have his hidden trees for you to get a personal message in. Please enjoy your day here and enjoy also the trees in the forest and come back when they're waking up in the summer. Thank you. <laughs>